Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to paper session three. Uh, we have three papers in this session, uh, hour long session. Our, our, our theme for our session is mobility and activity for children. And I will uh, just introduce the, the first paper. Um, it will be presented by Heather Feldner. And it, the title is Development and Implementation of a Longitudinal Community Based Early Mobility Research Program for Children with Mobility Impairments. So, uh, Dr. Feldner, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. I am going to share my screen here and just make sure that you can actually see my presentation with its purple screen. Does that look okay? Excellent. All right. Um, well, thank you all for attending this paper session. Um, I am presenting on behalf of my uh, co-collaborators and fantastic capstone student group. Um, that is Becca Barkas, Chelsea Barrero, uh, Sarah Dean, and Wendy Schneer. And the learning objectives here today are to identify three developmental or social benefits of power mobility device use for children with disabilities discuss two challenges related to the provision of alternative devices such as modified ride-on cars, uh, discuss two methods uh, for gathering real-time mobility technology use data without the need for a researcher present, um, and identify one way in which caregiver perspectives of disability and the role of mobility technology may shift following exposure to early powered mobility devices. And um, my disclosure is that funding for this work um, was supported by the NIH National Center for Advancing Trans Translational Sciences. Um, so just a bit of background, um, as, as we all likely know in this session, children learn by exploring their environment and interacting with the people around them. And uh, children who are unable to do that independently um, are at higher risk of secondary impairments, um, as well as a lack of opportunity. Um, and this um, includes communication, visual, spatial perception, cognitive, as well as social emotional development. Um, and early power mobility technology um, interventions um, have really been shown to promote um, not only initiate um, self or promote self initiated mobility, but also demonstrate improvements in social emotional competency, uh, communication, cognitive development, and self care in children as young as seven months of age. Um, there are some ongoing challenges um, in this space, um, and one of those is that disability uh, is um, often viewed from a medical model perspective. Um, and this is a perspective that individuals with disabilities should be cured or receive treatment to become more, quote, normalized. Um, this leads to pity, prejudice, discrimination, and harm, as well as negatively impacts both caregiver and child and clinician perspectives of disability. Um, one of the other challenges is that um, assistive devices, especially powered mobility, um, often carry increased stigmas. They're seen as a visible signifier of disability. Um, oftentimes, uh, families or even some clinicians uh, view these devices as a um, last resort as, um, after other mobility options are exhausted. Um, walking is viewed as the end goal um, or as the ultimate goal for early re rehabilitation intervention. Um, and there's also an ongoing lack of environmental accessibility uh, to contend with. Um, little research has really analyzed longitudinal mobility technology use patterns as well as um, their impact on pediatric drivers. And um, tracking of use in the community often relies on caregiver report, um, which can sometimes be inaccurate, as well as it increases participant burden um, in terms of research. So there are some growing opportunities in this space. Um, first, that um, uh, this integration of um, on-time mobility technology for children we know has a positive impact on caregiver perception of disability, um, and uh, this is often then integrated into the child's self-identity. Self um, we have new technologies that are being um, uh, created, uh, modified ride-on cars. Um, as well as um, other new uh, pediatric uh, devices, um, really addressing some of the uh, barriers that are associated with traditional powered wheelchairs. Um, there is um, this infusion of interdisciplinary uh, technology and methods into powered mobility research, as well as um, you know, new, new things being developed uh, continuously um, in, the, in this space. Um, so we really tried to take advantage of, of those opportunities um, for this study. Um, so the purpose of the study was um, to investigate the feasibility of using natural language processing tools to monitor social communication patterns in children using write-on cars. 
um, implementing a custom data logger to remotely measure ride on car use patterns within home and community environments and to evaluate the impact of ride on car use on child and family perspectives of disability technology and social emotional development across a one year period. Um, and so we had several methods in this study. Um, I'm going to talk a, a briefly about the, the um, method as well as the outcomes for each one of these. Um, we included automated ride on car use tracking, semi-structured interviews, disability attitude and powered mobility thermometer surveys, uh, Lena language environment recordings, as well as photo voice narratives. Um, and we wound up having 19 participants in our study. Um, four were either withdrew or lost, uh, were lost to follow up. So we have 15 complete data sets um, with um, a, a, base, a, a fairly even split between male and female participants. Um, a little uh, slightly higher, uh, nine males versus six females. Um, ranging in age um, from uh, about a year and a half uh, all the way up to about four and a half years old. Um, we also had 24 parent participants, including 10 fathers, which is a really cool perspective to get. Um, we had a pretty diverse sample, um, both in terms of racial identity and ethnicity, as well as socioeconomic status. Um, so the first part of our method was to uh, build a custom data logger. This was constructed sensor by sensor and integrate, integrated into the ride on cars uh, using an Arduino Pro mini microprocessor to capture real time use data remotely. Um, data included date, time, accelerometry values, GPS location, switch activation counts and wheel movement. And this was all stored locally on a micro SD card. Um, and we created a custom code in Octave, which is a version of MATLAB programming um, to analyze the data. Um, what we found was that um, car use varied, but was generally um, more concentrated into the one to 10 minute um, uh, increments. And this was about 60% of the car use that we found. Um, so out of a, a total of 322 switch hits um, across a subset of five of our kiddos, um, over two or nearly 200 of these occurred within that one to 10 minute period, indicating relatively short uh, driving bouts. Um, play sessions, which included multiple bouts, um, ranged between five and 70 minutes. And um, variance was calculated for both bout and session duration, um, which illustrated that single bout sessions had greater variance in duration compared to session with more bouts. Um, and so the variance for the total duration of the play sessions was greatest for sessions with three bouts. So the variance increased as um, the number of bouts increased. Our second method uh, was to employ semi-structured interviews. Um, we um, asked questions uh, to parents and elicited responses about everything from their family lifestyle, um, describing their child's mobility with and without the ride on car, um, the benefits and drawbacks of having the technology um, in their home, as well as their perception of the ride on car as a uh, toy versus a therapy device. Um, and we tried to ask the children uh, as many questions as we could when it was age appropriate. Um, things like, what do you like best about your car? Where do you go? What don't you like about your car? Um, and so these were all um, audio recorded and transcribed verbatim. Uh, we conducted interviews at three points in time across the year intervention. And um, we coded these using constant comparison until themes emerged. And then we shared our results back with the families to make sure that we were interpreting them accurately and avoiding, um, avoiding any errors. And this image um, on the screen here just shows an example of a quote and the coding process that we used to ensure rigor. Uh, so just some examples from our semi-structured interviews. Um, four themes emerged related to social emotional development and mobility as a pathway to agency. And three additional themes emerged related to communication, connections, and challenges. Um, and so just an example um, from one of our main themes, asking and advocating. Um, a mother said, now with this language development, he can say, go this way. And we've been working with him on twisting motions and all of this. So I would guide his hand a little bit. And then yesterday I was like, do you want to go look at that? Go that way. And I saw him make the connection, pull down with one hand and actually turn the car. Um, another family said, this car is like an executive thing for her. She has to make the decision to go and now she's activating, 
actively communicating with us. Examples from um, the, one of the other themes related to social emotional development was leveling the playing field. One parent said, even bringing it to daycare, the kids can be at his eye level. And so he gets to start to be a little bit more of a peer rather than the kid that's always to the side. Um, another family member said, it's interactive where he can be with other kids and it's a toy. It's different than a wheelchair, right? Where a wheelchair kind of gives a certain idea about a person, whereas this is a toy and then kids forget about that. So they were able to play all sorts of games with Cam in the car. One of the other methods that we incorporated into the study was to use um, uh, two surveys, uh, one called the Questionnaire on Disability, Identity, and Opportunity, which was adapted for pediatric populations, and two versions of a survey called the Powered Mobility Thermometer, um, with the second version adapted to gather perceptions about ride-on cars specifically. Um, this includes um, a, a visual scale from zero to 100 in terms of ranking how favorable you feel particular devices, and then it asks for qualitative descriptions of that device further down in the survey. What we found was that attitudes towards disability largely remain stable, apart from a significant increase in respondents' social model orientation after the ride on car intervention. And this was important um, because we saw a little bit of a change from that more traditional medical model of um, disability being an individual deficit in need of fixing. Uh, we saw ride on car favorability rankings increase. Um, and we also saw power, uh, other powered mobility device favorability rankings increase. Um, and this was interesting because the kids in the study did not have access to other powered mobility devices. They only had access to a ride on car, yet this experience made, favor, made their favorability um, more uh, improved when it came to other powered mobility devices such as wheelchairs. Um, so we found that really interesting. One of the things that we wanted to pilot as a part of the study was whether or not we could um, use um, natural language processing to, um, uh, to try and understand communication patterns in kids um, who may not have typical speech production. And so we used a small little um, credit card size recording device called LENA, um, which stands for Language Environment Analysis. Um, and we use this recorder to um, uh, record day-long um, uh, bouts of uh, the child and their um, uh, community and family interactions. We did this about every two months, and so we wound up having um, six, between six and eight recordings for each family across the year. Um, we specifically looked at conversational turns, which is the count of a child or an adult vocalization, um, as well as child vocalization counts, which was when a child initiated um, a vocalization. And this did not have to be word production. Um, it could be uh, sound production as well, which was a really neat part of the technology. Um, we used data filtration to uh, then uh, uh, clean the data and ran descriptive statistics, plots, and significance um, using um, non parametric Man Whitney U tests. And there's a picture on the screen that shows a little t shirt. That's how the recorder was worn. It was slid, slid inside the little pocket. Um, so, what we found, um, we had children across uh, communication. Uh, levels uh, in the study. And what we found was that um, the Lena really could accurately characterize vocalization trends and patterns in children with CP that may have unique or pre-verbal vocalization patterns. Um, we were unable to determine the relationship to ride on car use. Um, however, this is something that we're looking at uh, um, examining more closely in the future. Um, and the graphs on this um, slide just show um, a snapshot from uh, one of our participants who was uh, GMFCS level three and a communication function, a CFCS level two um, over time and over recording sessions. And we were able to see a steady increase um, in both conversational uh, turns and uh, child vocalizations. Um, and this result was significant for this particular child. Um, one of the last methods that we incorporated into this study was a photo narrative. 
Um, I really like photo narratives. Um, I think they're a simple tool. Um, you can use a cell phone camera or you can provide a family with a digital camera and SD card from your research lab. Um, and then you just give them a list of guiding questions and they have the freedom to take photos of whatever might be meaningful or important for them in regard to their mobility experiences. Um, I love using this technique because it's accessible to both kids and adults. Um, it's really visually impactful and um, it's data that, that the child and the family can create as co-researchers. They get complete freedom to, to pick their data, to narrate how they want, um, and uh, um, really kind of establish a different power dynamic in the research process. Um, and there's uh, just some examples of some guiding questions that I provide for my families. Um, but again, they have freedom to take pictures of whatever they'd like. So here are just two examples of some results from two different families in the photo narratives. Um, the first photo on the left shows two little girls, twins, sitting in a ride-on car together, and the mom narrated, the Go Baby Go car was a major excitement for every kid around, including Alexa's twin sister, Margo. At first, Margo was able to drive along with Alexa, and it added to some really beautiful sister playtimes. The photo on the right is one of my favorite in the whole study. Um, it shows a little girl in her ride-on car uh, pulling into an accessible parking spot at a school playground, and she's looking back at the camera. And the family narrated, we like it because she's parking in the disabled spot in the school. And so you know the car is for people with cerebral palsy or some motor disabilities. This is where she would park in the future maybe. So it, it again, really kind of set up that future thinking and that future advocacy and access um, for this particular family. And this child is, you know, was under two years old at the time. So that was really powerful. So in conclusion, um, we have a lot of rich data uh, from this study um, from a lot of different sources. And um, we were really excited to um, especially demonstrate that, that several methods of data collection were a be able to uh, be completed in real time without the need for a researcher to be present. Um, and that included the remote tracking with the data logger, the Lena language recordings and photo narratives. Um, we saw caregiver perception shift in two ways towards viewing disability on a broader social scale, as well as having more favorable perceptions of both ride-on cars and powered wheelchairs. Um, and we also saw that some challenges for ride-on car use still remain. Um, there are battery charging hassles, and there are generally low use frequencies um, across the year duration of time. Um, so future, um, future directions, just to conclude, um, our results are in review and are going to be published in sections throughout this coming year. And we've got some new studies that we're working on where we're um, uh, looking at um, both ride on cars and explore mini use. And um, we're currently analyzing the GPS unit uh, uh, data that was collected as a part of this study, as well as uh, starting an in-lab study on learning joystick use and, use and path navigation with the Explorer Mini. And thank you very much. I have some references and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up. Um, one thing occurred to me is sort of a research methods question is, how did you get this um, approved by the IRB? That's, that is a great question. So um, this was a really comprehensive study and this was part of a KL2 um, uh, research project. And so there were a lot of different components. And, you know, I think in some institutions, it might have been more of a challenge. Um, for me, you know, um, I had to show that the cars were safe. I had to show that all of the components that we were doing um, were, you know, were feasible and safe um, and um, was able to do that really successfully. Um, and so I, we just were able to describe in, in enough detail, I think, all of the different little components of the study um, to and, and, and provide enough data in terms of previous work that had been done um, in these areas um, that we then kind of combined and said, we're going to put several of these different discipline um, and technologies into one study and, and look at the, the, the lasting effects. So I think that that helped our cause a little bit. Um, you know, the other, the other thing was, is that we were really minimally invest, we were, we were minimally interacting with families across that year time. We really only had three time points where we were going into the families, um, families' homes and, and collecting data and, and, you know, downloading 
automated data and things like that. Um, and so I think that that was helpful um, in terms of IRB as well. So no privacy concerns on their part? You know, I think the um, what helped with the privacy concerns is that for the um, remote data monitoring, we were downloading data locally. We were not downloading to the cloud or uploading to the cloud, which I think made a big difference from our IRB perspective. Um, and then in terms of cameras, we did happen to have digital cameras that we gave out. And so sometimes there can be some IRB challenges with cell phone use, um, but we didn't run into that for the study because we did give them cameras and, and blank SD cards. Thanks, and congratulations. Thank you, great question. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, with when you give gave them the the digital cameras, did they use them that much? I can see how in a study like this, some people could be really into it and take a bunch of pictures and give you great data, and then some people could forget they have a lot of other things to worry about and not take pictures for you. Um, since you gave it such a free range, how did you deal with that? That's a great question. Um, thank you for that. How we decided to handle that since it was such a long study period, we um, focused the camera um, uh, in between the, the mid-study and the final study visit. So at the mid-study visit, I brought the cameras to the family homes, explained the process again, gave them some written material about it, and then said, you know, when you're done, let me know, but at the very latest, I'm going to collect these before our final visit so that we can talk about the photos and you can pick the ones you want at the last session. So I, I think we kind of just set up expectation of it's going to be several months, you can do as much or as little as you want. Um, and then it really like part of the co researcher thing with this technique is, is that they get to decide how much or how little they want to use it. So I did have some families that only said, Oh, we just got a couple pictures and that that was it. And then I had other families, like you said, that had a ton of, of, of interest in this technique and did a ton of pictures and we, we kind of had to say okay pick your top five like if you, if you had to pick. Um, and so that's what that's. Um, how we want to handling that and, and luckily we you know from all of our participants we we did get um i think there was one participant um that really wasn't into the camera very much and didn't participate in that that section of the study so overall we were pretty lucky and i think just how it timed out um you know it wound up um kind of fitting in with with whatever families thought that they could contribute in that way all right thank you we're going to move on to the second paper and it will be presented by Lisa Kenyon, and her uh, topic is Key Aspects of Power Mobility Interventions for Children, a Qualitative Study. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Dr. Felder, for that lovely presentation. I really enjoyed listening to it and learning about your research methods. Um, greetings, everybody, from West Michigan, where usually we have more snow than everybody else, but the East Coast has beat us out this week. I'd like to thank the ISS Conference Committee for the opportunity to present our paper entitled Key Aspects of Power Mobility Interventions for Children. I'm having trouble advancing my slides, so let me just see what I can do about that here. Hmm, let's try there. Key Aspects of Power Mobility Interventions for Children, a Qualitative Study. My name is Lisa Kenyon, and I'm honored to be presenting on behalf of our research team here at Grand Valley State University. We do not have any disclosures. Before we begin, we'd like to thank all of the families who've given their permission to show identifiable pictures of their children. Please protect the privacy of these children and avoid taking any screenshots of the presentation. As you are all aware, self-generated mobility, such as crawling and walking, propels the typically developing infant into a new paradigm wherein they are no longer dependent on others to move them from one place to another. This new paradigm radically changes their relationship between themselves and the environment, broadens the child's world, and unleashes a cascade of developmental and social changes in the child's path to independence. So whether the typically developing child is looking for a place to relax, climbing over their brother, practicing their keyboard skills, or exploring the wonders of plumbing, self-generated mobility allows and supports children's exploration, skill development, and learning. 
Children with mobility limitations, however, are often unable to crawl or walk, placing them at risk for secondary impairments in spatial cognition, communication, social development, and other developmental domains. Power Mobility Device Youth provides these children with numerous developmental and functional benefits. So whether the child is using an alternative power mobility device, such as a ride-on toy car or device designed for use in research, or a commercially available device, evidence supports the use of the power mobility devices for children. In this way, just like the typically developing child, whether the child with mobility limitations is exploring their environment, playing hockey with their brother, or again, exploring the wonders of plumbing, self-generated mobility provided by a power mobility device allows and supports children's exploration, skill development, and learning. Yet simply giving a child a power mobility device might not be sufficient for them to be able to learn to use it independently and with, um, within their environment. Um, however, we don't know a whole lot from research about the power mobility interventions that might best support a children and how to decide which types of interventions to use with which children. Work in um, power mobility research by Field and Livingstone in 2018 outlined three power mobility learner groups, exploratory power mobility learners, operational power mobility and learners, and functional power mobility learners. Exploratory power mobility learners require extended practice to learn cause and effect skills. That is, the, the develop the idea that they are causing movement of the device through activation of the joystick or switch. Oper operational power mobility learners are focused on maneuvering the power mobility device. And functional learners are focused on integrating the device into their daily lives. And it's typically these functional power mobility learners that typically meet the criteria for purchase of an individually prescribed power wheelchair. Given the differences amongst these three power mobility learner groups, clinicians may find it helpful to know which power mobility interventions might fit best with each learner group. So the purpose of our study was to explore the key aspects of power mobility interventions for children in each of these three power mobility learner groups. In this modified grounded theory study, data were gathered through face-to-face -face interviews conducted via Zoom or in person. Um, this allowed participants from around the world to take part in the study. Interviews were conducted with stakeholders from three different groups, children who used a power wheelchair, parents whose children use a power wheelchair, and therapist and clinician researchers experienced in providing pediatric power mobility interventions. Initial coding map stated intervention activities to each power mobility learner group based on definitions and an expansion of input from Dr. Field and Ms. Livingstone. Patterns within the data were then identified and codes were collapsed into thematic categories reflecting aspects of intervention for each learner group. Thematic categories were then cross-referenced um, such that we could identify aspects of the intervention that were relevant and pertinent to more than one learner group. We had 29 participants from five different countries participate in the study. And for each power mobility learner group, the exploratory, operational, and functional, we identified key aspects of power mobility interventions, as well as fundamental aspects of power mobility interventions that were applicable to all power mobility learners, regarding, regardless of which learner group they fell in. We also noted, as you can see in our graphic here, an overlap between the different stages, um, between the different learner groups. So it wasn't like you just suddenly became an operational learner. There was a transitional period and you didn't suddenly become a functional learner. It was, there was a transition period. So let's look at these um, briefly and see what we found. So within the fundamental aspects of power mobility interventions, we found in our data that um, collaboration, the need for us all to work together in partnership with the child, the family and caregivers and other professionals was key no matter where you were in this process of learning how to use a power mobility device. The equipment use and the setup and 
ensuring that the power mobility device and the access method met the learner's needs was also felt to be fundamental. Play involving incorporating playful activities into learning to use the device and having a fun approach that engage and motivated children was felt to be important again, no matter what aspect or where the child was in the learning process. Practice opportunities were recognized as important and involved using the power mobility device on a regular basis, as well as repeating activities multiple times to help support learning. And finally, in this area, safety. And that included keeping both the child and others in the area safe, as well as ensuring that the environment where power mobility device training or intervention was being conducted was appropriate for the child's specific learning level and abilities. For the children in the exploratory power mobility learner group, we identified key aspects to support intervention, such as allowing safe collisions. This was viewed as allowing the child to bump into things and to make sure that we had neutral responses to this. This is viewed as how children learn, but of course had to be done in a way that make sure that the child and the environment were safe and others in the environment. We also identified encouraging child-led learning and promoting accidental activation of the access method, method that joystick or switch. That child-led learning is really more about allowing the child to explore the access method, explore to the device in a rate that's comfortable for them. Whereas promoting that accidental activation of the access method during that child-led um, exploration may lead over time to supporting cause and effect understanding, providing manual guidance and demonstration, as well as simple consistent verbiage like stop or go or telling the child you did this or you are doing that were also felt to be important for this learner group. For the operational power mobility learner group, key aspects of intervention uncovered in the study involved building a vocabulary for safety. This included having um, helping the child to recognize and respond to safety instructions. And this was felt to be very important before the child progressed into that functional mo power mobility learner group so that the children could have an idea of safety, at least emerging. They didn't have to be perfect with it. Encouraging navigational problem solving centered on allowing the children to figure out from themselves what they felt their own best route was, because that's how they're going to learn to overcome problems. But it also included things like allowing the child to get themselves unstuck if they got stuck in a corner. Um, often as adults, we jump on to solving that problem for them. So allowing the child to kind of problem solve for themselves, but of course not allowing them to get overly frustrated. Facilitating multi-directional control, again, was felt to be um, excellent support in developing the child, children's navigational abilities. Fostering goal-directed mobility was felt to be very important for children who often had previously be, been dependent on others for mobility. And so they needed to develop an understanding of how power mobility allows them to act on their environment. We heard from participants about how a child would understand how to use the access method, but then would still fuss and cry because they wanted something on the other side of the room and didn't understand that they could actually have the power to go get it themselves. Promoting awareness of device boundaries stressed the need to help children to envelop the footprint of their device into their body schema. And finally, for our functional power mobility learners, it was found that encouraging self-advocacy skills, um, learning, helping the children learn to speak up for themselves in matters pertaining to their power wheelchair. And this included asking people politely to move out of the way if necessary. Facilitating typical childhood roles focused on helping the children to learn their power wheelchair, um, learn how to use their power wheelchair in everyday childhood activities, from playing, social activities, to doing chores and household tasks and developing that sense of responsibility and independence that's so um, important during childhood. Fostering advanced skills and functions centered on helping the children to learn how to use their power wheelchair in complex community settings like on public transportation, on busy um, streets, how to cross the street, those types of things, or in crowded environment, but also how to match the speed of their power wheelchair 
to meet the specific needs of the activity and environment. Promoting dual and multitasking involved learning to drive while simultaneously performing another motor or cognitive task. Often this was related to carrying on conversations and socializing. Finally, utilizing scaffolding was felt to help children learn by simplifying both tasks in the environment and facilitating children's learning of complex tasks and activities. Gradually increasing the complexity of both the task and environment was felt to help the child progress while at the same time promoting the child's success. The key aspects of power mobility intervention identified in this study are consistent with and aligned nicely with other published works, including the facilitating strategies provided within the Assessment of Learning Power Mobility Use Tool by Elizabeth Nielsen and Josephine Durkin. As we are all aware, all studies have limitations, and this study was limited by the inclusion of only English-speaking participants from high-resource nations and future research involving participants from a wider range of cultures and backgrounds would be beneficial. In conclusion, we found both similarities and differences in the needs of children in the three power mobility learner groups. And it is our hope that these findings may help clinicians and researchers to tailor power mobility interventions to meet the needs of children in each power mobility learner group. Because of the delay in having ISS, our study has already been published. Um, it, it is available here, just wanted to acknowledge that. Here are our references, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. This is my adorable two-year-old grandson. Thank you, Dr. Kenyon. So keep in mind that we are recording this, and people will be viewing this presentation at a later date, so they may be emailing you to ask. That would be so excellent. Don't be surprised Thank by you. That. And uh, for those of you watching, I encourage you to do that. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, Lisa, um, I apologize if I missed this because I think you did go over it, but what ways did you guys utilize um, scaffolding in the study? Okay, so this is a qualitative study. So what we identified was that using scaffolding was particularly helpful for children who were functional power mobility learners and who are learning to use their power mobility device in everyday life. With the pandemic, we have not gotten to do as much power mobility training as we would like, but I would say that we have implemented this with several of our one-on-one um, -on -one interactions, more case and clinical work, and look forward to involving a lot of these activities in our future research. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, great job. Okay, thank you. I'm not hearing any more questions. Um, we will um, we'll move to the next paper. And so this paper will be presented uh, by Martino uh, Avalis and Viviana, and I'm sorry, Viviana, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of your name, but Baiaridi, and you can tell me uh, how close I was. But I will turn it over um, to the two of you. Martino, can you just check and make sure you're um, you're not muted? Oh no, did we lose them? Can you hear us now? Yes. Oh, okay, that's the phone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It was a microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Dave, for this presentation. And uh, before starting, uh, um, I would like to thank you, all of you guys, to be here today. And uh, let me introduce very shortly uh, me and my colleague. Uh, my name is Martina Velis. I'm an Italian physiotherapist, and uh, uh, um, since 2005. Uh, I've been working in assistive technology field, and now I'm working. I've been working for an Italian company uh, which um, manufactures technical aids, and uh, 
I would like to... And hi everyone, hi, I'm Viviana Bayardi. I'm working as probiotic therapist in Italy for 13 years. Hi, at the beginning, I worked in some private center, and particularly at the Center Clinico Nemo at Milan with children with cerebral palsy and neuromuscular disease. Now, since 2014, I'm working in the Robert Roman Foundation with children with visual impairment, focused on motor and visual rehabilitation. Okay, now we're going to start. Okay. In many clinical descriptions of children affected by cerebral palsy, we have to face visual impairment or blindness with sensory deprivation and difficulties in the psychomotor area. The children with multiple disabilities and visual impairment have special needs because they often undergo sensory stimuli from the outside world. It's difficult to them to adapt themselves to the stimuli, and when they can, they can can do it with inadequate modulation. The repertoire movement is poor and not very functional. And finally, often closeness and repetitiveness are reinforced. So what are the main MCC and specific key points about the, this clinical condition? Inability to carry out an operation of the adaptation and modulation of responses based on external requests. Difficulty interacting, considering the external sensory stimuli, interacts with the external environment, having a limited repertoire of movements by listening and responding to reduce information. So, with this characteristic, the postural care and the postural choice become more important. So, the pediatric therapist can verify the most suitable posture for the child, also proposing, if needed, various personalized aids. It's possible to begin with the mutual swooping posture and then transfer the child to this site or sitting with or without facilitation. Temporary heads, baby chair, postural system, etc., can be used and adapted according to their rehabilitative goals, facilitating the improvement of them and their achieving. In, in children with cerebral palsy and visual impairment, due to what we are talking about, it suggests to warn them regarding a possible change in the environment. Room, stone, on postular heights, lights, noises, etc. Because from them it's very difficult and hard to analyze and process the different stimuli. The purpose of proper posture should be facilitation of the right positioning and possibly postural control, conditioned by pathological reflexes or partners. Facilitation and posture which enables the use of visual sense, and finally, facilitation of posture which allow a visual motor integration. For this reason, it's so important that the child's environment is adapted to his needs. Therefore, pay attention to the multisensory reality. But multisensoriality must be an added value and not a simple insertion of stimuli. So it's important to pay attention to all this sense, but not necessarily the inclusion of everyone. It's important to try to modulate and understand the sensory stimuli. And um, now we would like to, to, to focus your attention about the vertical posture. Kids affected by visual impairments find it particularly hard to keep an upright posture, even with the aid of a vertical stabilizer, for example. And this makes it more difficult for them to improve their trunk as well as head control and lower limbs loading. And furthermore, their perception of motion and of their own bodies is also often altered for the reasons explained before. The multisensorial stimulation could be really important for these one impaired and blind kids to give them an experience of sensory perception and improve their compliance. I believe that every one of, uh, of you knows the benefits to keep uh, the standing position and how it can improve several functions like the blood circulation, bones density, the peristalsis, 
breathing, body function, etc. And of course, uh, I, I'm not going to ex explain again. But we also know that keeping the standing position in a vertical stabilizers for a long time can be boring for the users, especially if they are children or kids. In other words, we should consider also the kids' compliance as an issue. So our question was, is it possible to ensure a better experience for the kids affected by CP or similar pathology and visual impairments while they are positioned in a vertical stabilizers? And answering to this question has been the spark for this study. How did we lead this study? A group of 10 kids affected from cerebral palsy as well as this metabolic called genetic syndrome and visual impairments was involved in the Robert Holman Foundation, an Italian and Dutch foundation for caring kids with blindness as well as visual impairment and cerebral palsy. We use the APP, the app, multisensorial standing for the trials, which is a, a vertical stabilizer that provides a sensory stimulation while the subjects keep the standing position. The concept behind this device is pretty simple. The physiotherapist, as well as the occupational therapist, etc., can give the opportunity to keep the standing position while the users interact with different sensory stimuli like sound, visual, and palestasic, that is, vibrations. So in this situation, we are not simply talking about standing, we are talking about a new sensory experience. The multisensory standing has an electronic hardware placed under the foot plate that can be connected to devices like uh, you know iPad, tablet, smartphone, PC, radio, and MP4 reader, etc., which provide to the kid audio and visual stimulation. If of course visual, if there's a screen or a monitor like a PC or, or a tablet, while spreading the vibrations produced by the sound in the whole component of the frame, in the whole part of the frame. The age range of the subjects involved was from 21 up to 48 months. And the subjects group was split in two subgroups according to these inclusions criteria. Children treated at Robert Holman Foundation, visual impairment with visus less of two slash 10, and cerebral palsies as, as well as other kind of pathologies with low psychomotor skills uh, with a gross motor function uh, classification system from two up to five. And you can see the kind of the pathologies we, we have considered. Encephalopathy, multicystic leukomalacia, microcephalia, corpus callosum hypoplasia, retarded postural motor development. And for all of these subjects, the common denominator was CVI, cerebral visual impairment. So in the subgroups were involved 50% males and 50% females. Our aim was to analyze the differences in compliance, attention, motivation, gratification, and performances between the two configurations. I mean, just with audio, just with sound and music, uh, and with audio and palestasic stimuli, I mean, uh, with audio and uh, with music and vibrations. What about the method? Each kid could handle a big switch with an on-off opportunity or on-off possibility, put on the standing tray for six minutes. The switch was connected to a, to a radio, turning on and off the radio, depending on their feelings, of course, if the subjects were unable to press the switch by themselves, we helped and assisted them. We looked at, and, at how many times the kids activated the switch, for how long time, and how was their compliance. Um, they were asked to push the on-off switch, which turned on off a radio device, and after that, the radio was connected to the multisensory standing hardware in order to produce, besides the, the amplified audio stimuli, also the vibratory feedback. 
And after showing to the children what they had to do and how the switch worked, we left the subjects to use the switch fully for six minutes, observing their reactions. And then there were any difficult for, for the children to, to, you know, to figure out the task, we helped them to push the switch every 30 seconds by supporting the arm and doing the task together. From these observations, some factors have been pointed out. First of all, uh, the time of using, I mean, the switch use time in seconds. And, and for how many times? Um, so switch using times numbers and the subjective satisfaction feedback. The proposed stimuli have been administrated for two consecutive days and reversed. That is, first with music and, um, and vibrations, and after that with just music. And we used the matching class administration to have four different groups of children which have been subjected to the stimuli in different way and time. The data obtained showed that uh, uh, when the subjects were submitted to a home sensory experience, I mean with audio and the, and the vibrations and palestasis stimuli, they decreased the number of switch activations leaving for a longer time the switch enabled uh, and the kids left the switch activated for a longer time up to 30 percent more with, with the multisensory stimulation configuration than with the simple audio stimulus improving their compliance too and in the second administration there were less switch activation and the hypothesis was that the children wanted to uh, I mean, to feel these more complete stimulus for a longer time. With both stimuli, music and vibrations, the switch activations were lesser than just with music. And that was really interesting because it seemed that the children wished to extend as much as possible that nice time. Most of the children improved the awareness, the alertness, um, as well as the, the, the personal acceptance by adding the vibration, the stimulus with the music, showing these full smiles and vocals, for example. And some of the subjects uh, beside vocals try to hold the beat and the rhythm with hands uh, clapping on, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the tray of uh, the vertical stabilizers. And the more we propose the known songs and music, the better results we achieved. For most of the subjects, even the head control improved, and some of them asked for vocals to have again the vibratory stimulus. Even the feedback and the compliance were, were good for the kids. Um, in the chart, the light blue represents very satisfied, the orange is satisfied. And above, there are the charts about the feeling with just music, below the charts with both stimuli. And it's clear how the compliance and best feeling with very satisfied increased with sound and vibrations. So what are the conclusions? Almost all of the visually impaired kids showed a better compliance holding the upright position for a longer time and with a better awareness. And about the clinical relevance, this kind of stimulation during the upright position can improve the sensory perception besides enhancing their motor skills, like, for example, the head control and the handling task. Here are some of our reference that we find out on the, you know, the most common database that you know very well. And uh, before uh, uh, and uh, our presentation, let me thank the Robert Hartman Foundation and in particular the team uh, uh, which we work with, uh, I mean, my colleague Viviana, Elisa Gariva, Giovanna Tono, Vittorina Schock, and Maria Eleonora Refo. Thank you to all the team and um, thank you uh, to all of you guys. And if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. Yes, please enter questions in the chat if you have any questions.
want to thank the two of you for participating from Italy. Very much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. It's a, it has been a honor and a great pleasure for us. Uh, honors all ours. <laughs>